Okay, Syed, we are live. Hi. Hi, everybody. Good evening. So today I'm going to talk about shoulder MRI. And uh, so we are going to show you the rotator cuff. So this is the rotator cuff. And uh, we are going to talk about some very mild sequences, I mean, few sequences and techniques, but mainly focus about the labral pathology and, and uh, rotator cuff. So this is the axial proton density MRI. And uh, this is the posterior tree labrum. And this is the entry in free labrum, which is torn. So we'll discuss with a lot of detail about this entry in free labrum. And this is the proton density again, coronal. And you can see dark signal, which is calcification. MRI is the one only drawback is that calcification is not very well seen in MRI as compared to the ultrasound and other modality. So we are going to talk about technique, anatomy, rotator cuff, and labrador pathology in few cases also. So about technique, we have to do, we are normally, we are doing oblique coronal. Uh, most of the time, proton density, as I told you before, that proton density, the resolution is very high. And we like that images. And sometimes we do T1 without sat, without fat sat, T1 without fat sat to see the muscles and bone. And uh, oblique sagittal, again, we do PD fat sat and one T1 without fat sat. And this is axial images, which we do PT fat set. And sometimes we added gradient sequences. No, it is because some, we have some machines which can do 3D. So that is much better than uh, other sequences. Another technical problem is that because here the supraspinatus is curved like this. So that angle 55, then we have magic angle artifact. That sometimes we confuse with tendinosis. So whenever you fall like that, uh, you have to see the thickening of the tendon as well as see the images which has high T2. So this has high T2 and this disappeared, magic angle. So that is not tendinosis, but magic angle artifact. Then we reach to the most important, you know, as MSK radiology, the most important part is anatomy. If I know anatomy, that most likely I know I will know pathology. So this is the spine of scapula. That means we are posterior. This is the coracoid glenoid and this is the supraspinatus muscle so this is the posterior so infraspinatus and will be teres minor here said uh, just a second can you make the marker a bit more thick okay is it possible yeah yeah i think so or you can choose yellow This is this is arrow is good. You yeah, arrow is arrow? fine. Yeah, arrow okay, is fine. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think is I will go with the arrow. No problem. So here the this is the supraspinatus, and this is the clavicle. This is the spine of scapula. This is the coracoid. And so now we'll go through the anatomy. This is the most important uh, sagittal cut, which is most lateral part. So this is the greater tuberosity, and this is the superior facet of the greater tuberosity with the attachment of the supraspinatus. This is the middle facet attachment of the infraspinatus. And here there's a small facet, which is inferior facet for teres minor. So this is the most lateral part of the GT, the tuberosity. So again, the, the, normally this is a flat for supraspinatus, which is almost one centimeter, 1.5 centimeter. Then this is the middle facet, which is oblique like that. The infraspinatus, this is almost two centimeter, 2.5 centimeter. And this is another one is small, which is teres minor, which is very rare to have any pathology. And this again, we are in the uh, sagittal image uh, without fat set. So this is the deltoid muscles. This is the acromion. And uh, these are the rotator cuff. So here again, we can see this is the biceps sternum. So medial to that will be the subscapularis and lateral aspect will be the supraspinatus. This is the infraspinatus and teres minor. Here is better seen. So this is the, again supraspinatus. This is the acromiohumeral ligament, which is now it has become very important as a part of the rotator interval, which shows about this uh, adhesive capsulitis. I'm going to show you later on. And these are the subscapulary slips, which is normally three to five. And this is the infraspinatus. This is teres minor. This is the triceps. And here will be the biceps, which is maybe then the next cut. 
Uh, Sir, just a second. Uh, can you remove the bottom shades of gray? Is it possible to remove the gray shades? Yeah, it's coming up in every slide. Are right, you okay? Yeah, even no. still, there are some more shades. Yeah, at the bottom. Can't see the shades. Yeah, just below, just below that marker. Yes, yes. I, I, I have, I have no shades there. It's okay. You can go forward, no problem. Okay. So again, uh, you know, orientation is very important. So this is the crocoid, this is the anterior, and this is the acromion, so posterior. So we have this is the subscapular slips. So we have we say F1, F2, F3, F4. Two, four, four, three to five slips are there, and this supraspinatus muscle, and this is the infraspinatus. This is teres minor. Okay, again, so this is the crocoid, this is the chromion, same same thing. This is just to uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle. And this is the most important. So we are going from the posterior aspect. So this is spine of scapula. Uh, then this is the triceps. Triceps normally have two tendon, one is dominant, one undominant. And this is the triceps attached at the gate tuberosity. So if I reach to the front, then I, if I can interrupt you once again, I'm yeah, sorry sure, about sure. it. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a similar rectangular triangle. I mean, a rectangle at the bottom. The remaining ones have gone, but still there's a, yeah, that one exactly over there. I can't see here anything. Okay, but it's coming up on the uh, screen as well as on YouTube as well. Is it possible to remove that? At the bottom. Yeah, yeah just below that. No, at the bottom, at the lower, lower level, still lower. We don't have anything. I have don't have anything here. Okay, surprisingly, it's there on YouTube as well. Okay, fine. We'll go ahead. No issues. Uh, okay. So here, I think this is the most important anatomy. And I like this coronal oblique uh, images. So this is, the, as I told you, I'm going from the entry aspect. See the coracoid. So this is the short head of the biceps. So I always start from here. So this is the short head of the biceps. Then I go next cut. This is the again subscapularis bundles. So F1, F2, F3, F4. Then again subscap. Then it will come long head. So when long head of tendon comes, long head of the biceps comes, then I normally stop because next will be the supraspinatus, which is the most important for us. So here there's an abnormality that there's a biceps tendon, and around the biceps tendon, there is a fluid. So you know, whenever I saw this, only two diagnoses. Either this is adhesive capsulitis or joint fusion. Normally, there should be no fluid around the biceps. So differential diagnosis would be either 99% is adhesive capsulitis, sometimes joint diffusion, rarely joint diffusion. So my diagnosis is now, you know, I see is adhesive capsulitis, so easy. So this is the biceps. And after the biceps, it will be the anterior fiber of supraspinatus. So this is the anterior fiber of supraspinatus. So what happened, again, the point which I normally like is the greater tuberosity facet, which is flat. So this is supraspinatus, flat, transverse, flat facet of the supraspinatus. And this is the supraspinatus tendon attached. So where the tendon attached, we call it footprint. Attached, that is the attachment we all footprint. So sometimes tear is here. So we call it footprint tear, or we can rim rent near that area. And this is the articular surface. And this is the bursa, subacromion, subdivided bursa. So we call it bursal surface. So when I go more lateral, so this is the mid fiber of the supraspinatus. So this is the mid fiber supraspinatus. When you go more lateral, so these are the posterior fibers of supraspinatus. Posterior fiber supraspinatus. Posterior fiber supraspinatus. Then you can see the footprint is become oblique, like uh, slant, like oblique. So that means we are now going to the infraspinatus. So these are the posterior bundle of the supraspinatus. Now it becomes slant and it disappears. So basically when it is becomes uh, slant, this is the infraspinatus. So normally by coronal and by sagittal, we came to know that exact where we are location is. So once more, I will go through this. So this is the coracoid. So we are in the anterior part of the shoulder. This is the short head of the biceps. This is the subscap bundles. Then we reach to the long head of the biceps. 
And as I told you, there is a fluid around the bicep. That means this is abnormal and most likely at a capsulitis or joint diffusion. Then this is the anterior fibers of the supraspinatus. And this we call it articular surface. This we call it bursal surface. And this we call it footprint. So any tear this area, we will say articular surface tear. This tear, we call it bursal surface tear. This tear, we call it footprint tear or rim rent. Rim rent tear basically is called it. So this is the, I will going to, and this is the, with the superior, superior labrum. This is the inferior labrum. This is supraspinatus, and this is trapezius. And this is the clavicle, there is acromion here. So this is the acromion. So I'm going to acromion shape later on. So this is supraspinatus, su superior labrum, inferior labrum. And here there's a, we call it critical zone, and this is the uh, attachment site. In this area, the blood supply is less, that's why most of tear is normally this area. So now we reach to oblique uh, images. So normally we do gradient or PD fat set. And here, this is the bicycle groove. This is the bicycle groove. So this is the lesser tuberosity. This is the greater tuberosity. And uh, here, this is the anterior labrum. This is the posterior labrum. So there is a pathology. So if I go to the top cut, so this is the top cut. So normally you have uh, heard about the hill sack defect. So Hillsack defect is normally present in the first three cuts. So first, second, so there is a Hillsack defect here because I have removed some of the cut. So if you see any defect in this area, in the first top three, that will be the Hillsack defect. Normally in the more in mid area, there is a normal defect come, which is a physiological. So this is not Hillsack defect. Hillsack defect comes on top of the humeral head, first three cuts. This is the bicycle groove. This is the greater tuberosity. And this is the lesser tuberosity. And here is the subscapular tendon. So these are the subscap subscapular tendon attachment. Here, this is the bicycle groove, and there is a fluid on the bicep groove. And the posterior labrum is fine, but anterior labrum there is a problem. So that I will discuss later on. But this is obviously there is a uh, bony fragment, and there is a. Uh, cut here. So this is the bony bank card. So we'll discuss this later on. So near of us going through the anatomy only. And uh, here in the posterior aspect, so anterior aspects is subscapularis, posterior aspect is the infraspinatus. And in the inferior aspect, this is teres minor. Uh, recently, last 10 years back, a new concept has come, which is a cable and crescent. So in the coronal image, you can see one area, which is the fibers are more dark, which is condensed fibers, and they have, that is called cable. And there are different type of rotator cuff. Some are dominant cable, some are less dominant cable. So those who have dominant cable, if there's a tear, the retraction will be less. So this concept has come cable and crescent. Crescent is that area and is the cable. Uh, now we'll, again, we'll discuss some uh, pathology. So this is the normal anatomy of the tendon, which is dark on all sequences. And uh, if become tendinosis, then should be thickened, like here is thickened, and intermediate signal. So this is called tendinosis. And here the margins here regular, so we call it fraying, fraying of the articular surface. And this is the footprint. So uh, this is the footprint, any tear here, we call it footprint tear. Any tear here, we call it articular surface tear. And I have example, so here. So this is the articular surface tear. Uh, this is the bursal surface tear. And again, this is the bursal surface tear. And sometimes the tear will be within the tendon substance, you call it interstitial tear. That can extend it to articular surface or bursal sur surface. Uh, this tear, again, uh, you can see there's articular surface also extending to the footprint. There are different names are there. I think I have some cases of that also. Uh, this is the grading system because sometimes there is a complete tear, then it need to be do uh, surgery. If there is a muscle atrophy is significant, then we can't do surgery. So there is a Gottnier, Gottnier classification. So grade three is a 50% muscle atrophy and grade four is more than 50%. So I think we, you know much better that grade three, sometimes they do surgery, but grade four, they will never try to do surgery because the outcome will be bad. Uh, there is a problem in that. So this patient has complete supraspinatus, 
tendon tear and tendon is retracted about here that means 2.5 cm retraction so if you go through the gortier classification this is a grade uh, 3 atrophy but if you see cor correctly that whole muscle is retracted and is good in conditions hardly grade 1 so that that's why whenever tendon is completely retracted then you have to see the coronal images and see the more uh, medial part of the muscle which may be normal so this may be false so that's why gortier classification is uh, sometimes maybe not so useful. Now we go on to the subscapular sternal. So this is a rare uh, type of injury where the lesser duplicity and part of the bone fragment avulsed with the subscapular sternal. And the same patient has also, this is the inferior green humeral ligament. And that's also injured. And a lot of bony contusions are there. And the most difficult part sometimes we missed is the subscapularis. So subscapularis, you have, there is a facet for the subscapularis and there should be some attachment. So here there is no attachment in the subscapularis, all the this is full thickness here of the subscap. So again, there's a bundle. So here the inferior bundles are there, but superior bundles are strong. Superior bundles is missing. Here again, there's a partial tear. This bundle is missing, subscapularis. And sometime there is a complete rotator cuff or supraspinatus tear. And the joint fluid extend through the AC joint and goes outside the joint, outside the AC joint, above the AC joint. That we call it the gracer signs. And this is again one of the uh, injury which is what we call capsular injury. So whenever we find some signal outside the joint extending through the muscle, that means there is a capsular ha injuries happen and has to be repaired. Uh, this is the, you know, as I said in the NRT that we have around two bundles of the infraspinatus. So here one of the band, band is torn and retracted. And this is, uh, we call it novel lesion. Now, uh, this is another type of uh, impingement, which is, uh, we call it posterior superior impingement, where typical the articular surface of the posterior fibers of the supraspinatus is torn. So exact like this, and this is a so this is the uh, rim rentier, and the patient has also uh, okay. This is the just go through. We will take later on. So okay, so here there is a tear at the attachment. So sort of footprint here plus articular surface here, and this is interstitial uh, tear, which I have already discussed be before. And nowadays we have a lot of cases which it's a very painful condition. So as I told you before, the MRI is sometimes we fail to pick up the calcification as compared to the ultrasound. So this dark signal, basically better seen in the gradient echo, dark signal, these are the calcification or hydroxyapatite crystals in the tendon. Sometimes it goes into the bursa and sometimes within the bone. That's a very painful conditions. So these are the intraosseous hydroxyapatite crystal deposition disease. Uh, sometimes people confused with or osteoastoma also osteoastoma is not common in the old age and this is normally the age group is 30 to 40 so these are the hydroxyapatite crystal deposition disease okay so here we are i was showing you this is the same slide which i have shown you before so there is a uh, superior uh, lateral tear slab tear this is the articular surface tear of the posterior fiber supraspinatus so these are the uh, posterior superior impingement, those who making this, you know, over proactivity, they develop this. And sometimes there is a posterior capsule thickening. And this, the mechanism, I'm not going to detail, but this is called glenohumeral internal def, uh, articulation deficit, GERD. So there is a posterior, posterior decentralization of the humeral head, and the posterior capsule will be thick. Uh, this is the most important uh, area, which is called a rotator interval. So, a space between the supraspinatus and subscapularis, that area you call it rotator interval. And the content are the uh, coracohumeral ligament, then uh, biceps sternum, and the biceps pulley. So, these are the content of the uh, rotator interval. And there are two, three diseases where there is a, this, these things are uh, obliterated. So one thing is the anterior superior impingement that can cause some of uh, edema here, then the injury to the rotator interval, 
and adhesive capsulitis or adhesive capsulitis may be the end result of these things. So where there's a coracohumeral ligament will thicken and the fat under the coracoid will be obliterated. And you know, these things are also common in the axillary pouch. So pouch, there is, a, there is a adhesions and fluid will come out from there into the biceps. So normally the clue is that whenever I see fluid around the biceps, then okay, this is most likely adhesive capsulitis. Then as you know, during the examination, the external rotation will be less. So this is adhesive capsulitis. So normal, uh, so again, I'll go a little bit of more detail. So this is the biceps tendon and this is the coracohumeral ligament. So coracohumeral ligament normally thickness is three millimeter, 2.5 millimeter is more than four is abnormal. Or sometimes what I do should not be thicker than the biceps. This is the coracohumeral ligament and just inferiorly is the superior glenohumeral ligament. And this coracohumeral ligament is basically extend medially and laterally. In the medially it goes and also extend subscapularis. Lateral is also goes superior inferior part of the supraspinatus tendon. So, and it's around the biceps, so form a biceps pulley. So here the most important is adhesive capsulitis. The, how we see it. So first the coracohumeral uh, ligament will thicken. Then the fat normally in T1, there should be normal fat. This fat become dirty, like some signal will be there. So that we call it adhesive capsulitis. And this is the classification of the uh, biceps pulley injury. And uh, as there's some sometimes injury of the superior glenohumeral ligament, sometimes coracohumeral ligament. So if it's a coracohumeral ligament lateral injury, they end up into the biceps goes outside, it's the grade four. And if it is a medial bundle, medial part injury, it goes inside the subscapularis dislocation. So these are the bully, uh, biceps pulley uh, injury. So now I think rotator cuff, uh, I have uh, finished. So I'll end up uh, going to instability. So this much is enough? Yes, I uh, carry on, please. Okay, good. So now I am going to instability. So the instability is the most part, most important is the labrum. So labrum, we go through, you know, the clock, uh, clock uh, five, like 12 o'clock is superior, six o'clock and uh, inferior three o'clock in the anterior, nine o'clock posterior. Again, some institution, they do reverse, but most of the institution do go clockwise. And the good thing is that the, we divide the, the clockwise into uh, like this. So, so this is the superior quadrant. This is the, uh, uh, so this is the superior quadrant. So this is the basically so, uh, anterior superior is most of the where there is a normal variant and anterior inferior where there's a maximum pathology. This is also pathology but less. So anything comes between the anterior superior quadrant will be a normal variant. Only superior quadrant will be a normal variant or slap and anterior inferior will be some important pathologies like bank card. So as you said that uh, anterior inferior will be the pathology like Pancard, Alapsa, we are going to discuss this. And uh, the slap is at a superior uh, part around uh, 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock. And entry inferior will be a uh, normal or normal variant like sublevel foramen and several sulcus. So from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, there is one entity sublevel foramen, which is quite uncommon, not common. Sublevel cirrhosis is quite common which is almost 73% population, which is around uh, 12 o'clock position. And uh, Buffett complex also very, very rare, which is absent anterior inferior labrum with thickened middle glomerular ligament. We are showing some cases. So sublevel recess, which is more common. So normally what happened, if you see the cartilage, so this is the cartilage. And that, that after that, there is a recess, which is very parallel to the recesses less than two millimeter, and that does not extend beyond the biceps attachment. So that is the sublabral recesses. So this is the normal variant. Another entity is the uh, Buffett complex where this is absent anterior superior labrum and thickened middle glomerular ligament.
and as i told you the most important part is the anterior inferior quadrant which has uh, sort of uh, important pathologies so i will go one by one so the least uh, least severe is the glad this is a gleno lateral articular deficit basically articular defect so this is the cartilage and there is a defect here in the cartilage that does does not causes any instability so that's why no surgery is needed for the glad lesions and next is basically parthes so here what happened so this is the periosteum so periosteum is separated from the bone so we call it sleeve avulsion periosteal sleeve avulsion and labrum is attached to the periosteum so labrum is torn but attached to the periosteum so we call it parthes and later on sometime it retract medially that we call it alapsa antero lab uh, anterior labral ligamentus periosteal sleeve avulsion so retract medially and uh, the most important basically which is more common is bankard so bankard the, there is a labral tear there is a periosteum tear at this fragment is separated that we call it bony uh, bankard disease soft tissue bankard and this is the bony bankard and sometimes same thing because of posterior dislocation happen opposite side we call it reverse bankard so i am going to show you some uh, multiple cases so as i told you before the top three cuts will be the hill sack defect so normally we measure its uh, how much length is the hill sack uh, hill sack defect and here there is a in the anterior inferior there is a large fragment so this is bony bankard and this is the this is the labrum this is the peri uh, periosteum so this is bankard lesion uh this is the posterior labrum but anterior labrum is not here instead it is Uh, medially retracted, retracted. So this is alapsa. This is the again. This is the defect in the glenoid, and uh, you can see the. This is the labrum which is retracted medially. So this is the posterior labrum, but anterior labrum is retracted medially. So alapsa. And this case. Uh, Uh, same case. This is without arthrogram. This is with arthrogram. In fact, if radiologist is good, then does not need arthrogram because of three Tesla V60 channel. We can see easily. So there is a defect here, and this is the torn labrum. With arthrogram, it's quite easy to diagnose. This is alapsa. So this again, that is extending to the superior labrum. so this is the superior labral tear same thing extending to see call it slab 5 which is we'll discuss later and this is the as i told you before this is the labrum anterior inferior labrum this is the posterior inferior labrum and there is a cartilage defect so this is a glad lesion and here there is a lab uh, labrum which is torn separated from the periosteum so this is bankard and here there is a tear in the labrum and periosteum is intact such sometimes we do a a, a, a beer view where the hand is abducted and national rotated so there we uh, beer we can see easily the tear a beer a beer uh, sequence and this is alapsa that so this is the posterior labrum which is correct and anterior labrum is torn and retracted so alapsa this is the posterior labrum which is normal and anterior labrum between the there is a the glenoid there is a defect so this is parthes lesion here again parthes lesion and a bony fragment is separated we call it bony bankard again there is a bony fragment separated this, this is the bony bankard and this is the hill sack defect so now we will discuss slap lesion so which is a uh, another important part so how to differentiate slap versus sublateral recesses so as i told you sublateral recesses will be the cartilage and this is parallel to the cartilage and does not extend beyond the biceps so this is the normal variant here this is the uh, bright signal which is extending into the labrum opposite to the cartilage so that's the lab the slap too and here this is a normal variant where there is a 
uh, sublabral foramen where this there's a labrum is separated from here but attached to uplo and this is the variant where uh, this is the, this is the slab 5 where labrum is torn attached below this area Uh, so again, how to differentiate? So here, this is the bicep sternum, and this is the superior labrum, which is has a sulcus, which is not extending beyond the biceps. And this is the cartilage, and this is extending towards the cartilage. So this is the normal variant, sublabral sulcus. Okay, here there is a signal which is going opposite to the cartilage. So this is slab. So slab is going to divide into ABC. This is, which is uh, slab which is going anteriorly, which is slab A, then slab one, or this is going slab posteriorly, slab two. So like this, there is a division. So we have to describe this. There is a superior tear extending anteriorly or posteriorly like this. And uh, in the old age, very common, there is a irregularity and sub signal in the Supreme labrum, we call it degenerative changes, which is common after 50 years of age. And this is the signal which is going away from the cartilage. So this is slap two. And sometimes there is a, there are like, we, could, we call it double Oreo sign. This is a slap three or bucket delt here. And sometimes the flap goes down. So we call it, or extending towards the biceps, slap four. And these are normal slap classification even it's reached to 13, 14. So this, these are all common. If you remember till five, this will be enough. So like sometimes the, there is a labral tear, supreme labral tear or bank card lesion, which goes supremely. So we call it slap five. Sometimes there is a flap, which is called uh, slap six. And this is extending to the uh, supreme labral tear, extending to the middle grumal ligament. We call it slap seven. And this is the, Supreme labral tear extending posteriorly. We call it slap eight. And slap nine is all around. Uh, all around, that means whole labrum entry posteriors, everything is torn. And slap 10 is when the supreme labral tear extending into the uh, rotator interval or superior groom ligament. And nowadays, last uh, three to four years, there is a new management has come, which is we call it on track or off track. So the concept is that if the glenoid tract is more than hill sac defect, if glenoid tract is more than hill sac defect, that means it is on track or non-engaged or non-engagement. And if the glenoid tract is less than the hill sac, then this is off track. That I will show you how to do that. So, and that's why nowadays the uh, surgery has been modified. So we have to calculate glenoid tract. So we sometimes calculate in CT scan. We sometimes we calculate on the MRI. And the most important line we have to mention that what they have uh, found out that glenoid tract is uh, normally 83% of the glenoid diameter. So when we uh, raise our hand and you know that one, so that articulate 83% of the glenoid. So that is the requirement of the glenoid tract. And hill sac uh, size or hill sac interval is the width of the hill sac. And sometimes we have to measure the area, which is sometimes uh, re required, sometimes not required. So, so, so here we have to. That means we for the for the interact or track, we not we we need two things. One is hill sac size, and we need to know about glenoid track. So in this case. Uh, this is the glenoid. So there's a we call it a rule of uh, circle. So we make a circle. And uh, this is the diameter of the circle. So we will calculate 83% of this. So suppose this is uh, 30. So 83% of 30 will be around 27, 26. So that is 26 is the glenoid tract. Then we have to minus this also. Suppose this is minus four. So that means we have to minus of that tract. This will be the glenoid tract. Okay. Another thing is the percentage of glenoid loss. So this is the, this is the total diameter. 
and this is the glenoid defect, uh, defect in the glenoid. So what we'll do, uh, uh, defect divided by diameter, that will go the percentage of the glenoid loss. And there's a formula that one millimeter glenoid loss, one, one um, uh, millimeter glenoid loss equal to 4%. So easy to calculate. So this is the case. So this is a hill sack defect. So it is around, uh, if I measure it, so this is the hill sack normally we measure like this. And this is the sort of uh, labral tear, entry-free labral tear, whatever bank card purchase. And uh, this is the glenoid. So what I will do, so suppose here there's a, uh, we'll, this is already in circle. So we'll make a circle around it. Then we calculate the glenoid diameter. Then 83% of this will be the glenoid track. So suppose glenoid track comes out uh, 16 and defect is five. So that means, and here there's no much glenoid loss, not much glenoid loss here. Much. So that means this is on track and also the glenoid loss is this. So this patient needs simple arthroscopic management. Another, another uh, example. So here you can see the normal posterior labrum, but here there's a soft tissue bank cut. This is torn. Okay, this is the hill sack defect, which is around 10 millimeter. And, uh, and so we have done a circle and uh, okay, image my image is here, I can. So suppose this is uh, diameter is coming around uh, 20. So 20, uh, so glenoid track of 83% 20 is 16.6. Uh, uh, and this is the small defect, two millimeter. So did minus two. So 14 point, this is the glenoid track. So glenoid track is 14 and hill sack defect is 10. So this is on track. So this is the way we normally measure the glenoid track. So we go a little bit more, one example more. So here the, okay, hill sack size is basically, this is the hill sack. So it's around 8.9, 8 hill sack 8.9 millimeters. And uh, here there's a bony bank card and the glenoid loss. So here diameter is about, uh, uh, glenoid diameter is about, uh, 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 they have, uh, this is 13.6 uh, by double. So that means here the glenoid track is, this is 20 uh, around, this is basically glenoid diameter is 27. So 80, 83% of 27 is 22. So 22 minus seven, this is the defect. So come out to be 14.6 millimeter. This is the glenoid tract. And the patient, this patient has hill sack 8.9. That means the track is bigger than the hill sack. So this is again on track. So here the glenoid loss, they have, we have to calculate glenoid loss also. So by this method, you can do that one. So here, this is, I think this is the last uh, on track, off track example. So this is the hill sack size, which is 14 millimeter. And this is a bony bank card diesel. So here the uh, glenoid track is, uh, glenoid track is 12. So how they calculated? Uh, this diameter is basically, the glenoid diameter is uh, 24. So 24 minus, 24, 83% of 24 will be uh, uh, plus minus this uh, 12. So it came 12 millimeter. And here the hill sack is 14. So their hill sack is more than glenoid track. So this is the off track lesion. And also the glenoid loss is more than 25. So this is, I have to go for lethargic procedure, which is more very difficult surgery. A few cases we have, which is a, uh, hypoplasia of the glenoid in the posterior aspect. We call it retroverted glenoid. So here you can see there's a posterior labral tear. And you can see the normally the glenoid is two, one to two percent antiverted. Here the glenoid is retroverted. Uh, this is a rare causes. Uh, here there is a joint diffusion.
there is a joint diffusion, then there is a articular disruption and lot of uh, crystal and loose body. So this is Milhawke syndrome. This is very rare. Once a year, we see the cases. And these are the uh, one in the epiphysis, we call it a vascular necrosis and same entity in the diaphysis, we call it osteonecrosis. So these are osteonecrosis.